Hello, Dennis. Glad to see you healthy and safe, considering everything that is going on in New York. Dennis, you were Attorney General of New York State, and uh, you are probably well familiar with uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo. As we all know, New York State was the epicenter of coronavirus epidemic, but now the situation uh, seems to have stabilized and New York has become a safer state. Does Governor Cuomo deserve credit for this? Well, first of all, good afternoon, Dimitri, and it's a pleasure to be with you. It's always an honor to join you and your viewers. Uh, and thanks for being such a gracious host when, when I join you. Uh, I wish that I was in Israel so we could be doing this on, on the set together. Uh, but unfortunately, during this uh, pandemic, uh, we're, we're, this is the second best way to, for us to get, to get together. Uh, so the, the situation in New York uh, is somewhat unique. In, in, in my view, because uh, it is really, it has been uh, the epicenter of the pandemic uh, in the United States, um, which is somewhat curious because other large uh, states such as California, uh, Illinois, you know, where there's large cities, uh, the, the numbers haven't compared to the numbers that we see here in New York. For instance, uh, the number of deaths uh, across the United States are just a little bit more than 125,000, uh, but yet 31,000 of those deaths, or about 25%, uh, are right here in New York State. So, you know, while New York is not the most uh, populous state in the nation, uh, it's, you know, third or fourth now between behind California, Florida, Texas, uh, it it's, leads the nation in the number of reported cases and unfortunately, in the number of reported uh, deaths. Uh, as far as the governor is concerned, I think that, you know, ultimately uh, it will be left to history to determine, you know, whether or not his policies were effective, uh, mostly because, you know, you have to weigh the, the, the number of, of cases that I've just cited, the number of deaths, but you also have to take into account, you know, the economic harm that has been brought to bear as a result of his policies to close things down. And while we are reopening in phases across New York State, uh, for instance, in New York City, uh, there's still a long way to go. So uh, New York is a challenging state. I think the governor has has done a, a, a as good a job as, as he can, but the effectiveness of it really won't be, you know, the effectiveness of his policies won't be determined for some time in my estimation. Recently, we saw that Mayor de Blasio of New York City allowed Black Lives Matter protesters to violate social distancing rules. But the same mayor, de Blasio, would not allow religious Jews to congregate and conduct weddings and funerals. Please tell us from the U.S. legal perspective, is Mayor de Blasio discriminating against uh, the Jewish community? Is he allowed to permit one group to congregate while not permitting other? Well, that's a very interesting question. It raises, I believe, the, the conduct of uh, Mayor de Blasio, and frankly, the conduct of Governor Cuomo and you know, uh, elected officials across the United States raise serious constitutional issues in my estimation. Um, and this is, you know, this is foremost in my mind. You know, I, I, and when I was in elective office, when I was the Attorney General of New York State, um, you know, I knew those communities in Brooklyn and Williamsburg, uh, Borough Park. I knew those uh, religious communities very well. I was very uh, concerned about their issues then, and I remain concerned about their issues now. There's a city councilman, uh, Kelman Yeager, who is now a city councilman who 25 years ago was an aide on my staff. So he helped me to better understand, you know, issues in, in these uh, neighborhoods which were uh, populated by a, a several, you know, a lot of re re religious Jewish families. Um, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution was was purposely drafted as the First Amendment. So our founding fathers, when they created this great nation of ours and the blueprint of how the government would work, as they turned to the first to the amendments to the Constitution, which were designed to reflect on you know how the government should interact with the people there's a reason why 
re religious freedom was the First Amendment. Uh, and it also, the, the, there is, was a reason back in the 1700s why freedom of association and freedom of speech were combined, were joined together with the freedom of religion. Because when you think about it, they are intertwined. Your ability to assemble, your ability to speak about your religious issues, and your ability to worship as you choose are all covered by the First Amendment. So when an executive, whether it's the mayor of the city of New York or the governor of the state of New York or any other state, begins to unilaterally, without legislative authority, other than just a broad grant of power, starting to restrict religious freedoms, I think that Constitution is being violated. Now, you know, I'm not going to be in a position where I'm going to compare, you know, the protesters, you know, de Blasio not limiting the protest while limiting religious um, uh, gatherings, because I think just limiting the religious gatherings, standing alone, if there was no comparison, there was no counterbalance of the uh, protesters, I think that the restriction on religious liberty standing alone violates the United States Constitution. Dennis, I've mentioned earlier that you were the Attorney General of New York State, and prior to that you also served as Chief Federal Prosecutor for the Western District of New York. You had spent decades in law enforcement before going into private practice, uh, which is why I want to ask you, did you ever see the kind of disturbances that we have seen in the United States over the last months? From here in Israel, when we watch TV, it seems like a loss of control. Can you comment, please? Well, Dimitri, I could understand why you and your viewers uh, uh, have that impression, because uh, you know, information is so available through the internet. I mean, here we are. You know, today I'm I'm speaking to you 7,000 miles away. You're you're in Israel, and I'm in Buffalo, New York. So, you know, the internet in many ways has shrunk the world and made information more available. Uh, unfortunately, because I I know you, and I know that you're a, a a young man with a young family. I know that you're several years younger than I am. And my colleague, uh, Jan Brzezanski, is also several years younger than I am. So what you might not remember, and maybe what many of your viewers don't recall, is that in 1968, uh, we had in the United States a similar uh, type of turmoil. And, and I was, you know, I wasn't yet voting age in 1968, but I was old enough to pay attention to understand. Uh, in 1968, think about what, ha what was going on in 1968. You had all of the protests on college campuses across the United States uh, in opposition to the Vietnam War or the U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. Uh, in April of 1968, you had arguably the most um, uh, well-known and most recognized um, and most uh, um, uh, adored civil rights leader, Martin Luther King, was assassinated in April of, of 1968. You had the sitting president, Lyndon Johnson, decide that he wasn't going to run for re-election in March of 1968. That led to Bobby Kennedy, President Kennedy's brother, to enter the presidential race, and then he was assassinated in, in June of 1968. So by, by time those events all came together, America was ablaze. Cities were being, were being burned. You know, the uncontrolled riots and protests in the streets. College campuses were being overrun by, by students who were in opposition to the war. It, it was a very grim time. It was a very grim time at that point in time of our, of our national history. Uh, it led, arguably, to the election of President Nixon, to Richard Nixon as the president of the United States. Um, but, you know, what's happened since 1968 is America has truly blossomed. I mean, the 20th century you know, truly was an American century. And a lot of the accomplishments of, of the United States, including landing on the moon, that happened a year after all of these riots. So we've picked ourselves up before as a nation, as grim as these protests are, as grim as the, the COVID crisis is and the, the unemployment, the protests in the streets, America is a resilient country and America is built on people who are forward looking and not bad, backward looking, which is why I think we will overcome this. Denis Wako, thank you for being with us today.